Welcome to this third video in this workshop. And in this video, we are going to look at working with files, texts, and particularly also regular expressions. And we will start this video with looking at how we can open and read and write files. And in Python, or generally in most programming languages, this is a multi-step process. So the idea is on our file system, we have a file, for example, file.txt. Then we open that file and just opening the file doesn't do anything. Then we read the file and we read as much content as we want. And then after we've done whatever we want to do with the data, we then close the file again, or after we read the data. Now in Python, there is a construction and there are other ways of doing this, but this is the most common way of doing it that looks like this to the left here. So we're using this construction with open, then the file name, and then the mode in which we want to open this file. And there's various modes, R for read, W for write, and so on and so forth. So here, R for read, then as, and now we are giving this an, a name as F, and then within that block, so this is a with construction, within that block, we read data into this variable data by using f.read. And now we could do this without this with construction, but what this with construction does is it is handling all of the opening and closing for us without us doing anything. So we can't forget, for example, to close the file. So this is a very commonly used shorthand to do all of that. So we are opening the file, we are giving the file a name, f, a variable name, and then we are reading from that file. So f is the file then, and then we are reading from it. Now, instead of just using nothing in here, we could also give read a number, and then we re would read this many bytes from the file, or we could also use read lines, and then we would read the file line by line, and then we would end up with a list of lines. So let's look at this in actual code and move over to Google Collab. Okay, so the first cell you see up here, here I just download or git clone the repository so that we have data available. And I also install text directory, which we are going to use later. You don't have to overthink this, but just as a side note, within these notebooks, especially within Google Collab, you can use the exclamation mark, and then you can run commands on the machine on which this notebook is running. So you don't have to know anything about this, but you can run, if you know about, for example, Linux commands or shell commands, you can run these here. So for example, we can run um, dir or ls to get all the files in that folder. And we can do this using this, ex this exclamation mark. You don't need to know this. It's just so that you have an understanding of what happens here. Okay, so now we're going to use that thing we've just seen, this with open construction. Now up here, I'm doing something that looks probably a little bit confusing. I'm using the path lib, and that's a library within Python that helps us to work with file paths. We don't need to use it, but it's a good practice and it allows us to build solutions that are more robust across systems. So you don't have to fully understand this, just ignore it for now. The important bit is that. And what I'm doing here is so with open, and then I'm giving it giving it that data folder here, and that just refers to this folder. So within our folder Python program for linguists 2020 data, there's a folder called Wikipedia. And in that folder Wikipedia, we have a couple of text files. And we're just opening the python.txt file here. So if we go into, if we look at this, and we can just use that same little trick here, so we can do ls, and then I'm just going to copy paste this in here. So ls is for list and we can run this. And so in that folder, we have three files, Cologne, Linguistics, and Python.txt. Okay, um, we could also just put the whole path in here instead of this construction here. So let's just go with that. Then we are going to use R for read as file. We've seen that, and then we're going to read data with F read. So let's run this and then have a look at that. And now we get text, and this is the text that's in that file. And this is an excerpt from Wikipedia. So just to show you what else is possible here. So if we don't do the full read, and I 
said that in the or I showed you that in the PowerPoint. If we do f dot read and then ten, we read ten bytes. And ten bytes would be ten characters if this is just text. So let's do this. So let's run this, and now we just get Python is and a little bit of white space here. So this then would just only read the first ten bytes of that file. And it's important to remember, opening is not reading. So we open the file and then we read as much as we want or we write as much as we want, and then we close the file again. And this opening and closing is done using this with construction here. So let's look at the third option here, and that is read lines. So, and I, you see I'm commenting this out and then I'm uncommenting this. So I'm using this comment function here to show you different um, variations of that. So if we do read lines and now do that, we will get a list and this list contains individual lines. So I can now also use indexes here. So I can do um, data zero and now this will give us the first line. And in these files, each line is one paragraph. So that's another way of doing that. Now, just to show you what this with construction here does, we could do the same thing manually. So we could do something like f is open. And now I'm just going to show you that this works without this path lib magic here. So we could just do that and then python.txt, comma r. So this is just a regular function. This works just fine. And then we could do f.read. Let's do 10. Okay, but now, since we didn't use this with construction, this file is still open. This is still like dangling around. And this is not good because this will hog up system space and it is also dangerous because we could now do bad things with it if we don't remember that it's still opened. So we would now to have to close this using f.close. And now we did effectively the same thing we did with this with construction, but this is just a very neat way and this is the recommended way of doing that to get all of this in one go. And then you don't have to think about opening and closing all of these things. So let's get rid of these lines again here. And let's look at writing files. And writing files works very similarly. So basically the same thing. Let's say we want to, let me just put this back to how it was in the beginning. So with writing files, so let's say we have data. So we have this string here. This is some text we want to store. And now we are opening the file again, but this time not with the R mode, but the W mode, so for write. And then we do f.write instead of f.read, and this will write the data. And since we're using this with construction, the file's then already closed once this has finished. And now we can use another command, cat. Cat will show the content of a file. To look at this file after we ran this, let's look at the file. And now this is in the file. Just to show you that this actually works, this is some text we want to store. Let's, let's just add ABC at the back here and then now let's look at the file and we have just added this to the file and this is how you read and write files in python it's very straightforward and it's just best to always use this construction here this with construction all right let's look at some text now that we know how to open and close files and read and write files okay so before we look at anything in particular, I just want to note that since Python 3, strings are always stored as Unicode. So we're always working with a Unicode and it's UTF-8 by default. So we don't have to worry about too much. Strings or str objects, string objects, are just sequences of characters. And we've looked at a couple of these. So they essentially just look like that. It's a variable name and then it's a number of characters. It's a string that is within quotation marks. And you can either use single quotation marks or double quotation marks, or even um, triple quotation marks. Internally, a string is just a sequence of characters. And if I say characters, I actually mean Unicode code points. If you're interested in that, I'll look that up. But what we can do is we can almost treat this as a list. So within that string, and that's what I tried to show here with this little table, we have these three characters and we can also use them or access them just as as if this were a list. What we can also do, and that's also true for lists, is we can do slicing. So instead of just giving, for example, this print statement here, one index in a square bracket, we can also give it more. So we can use start and stop, and then we slice part of that list, or in that sense, part of that string. So here we start at the index zero, at position zero, and we go up to the position two, 
which is the C, but we go up to there and we don't take it. So zero colon two will then give us AB. You can all do the same thing with lists. Now that we know what strings are, at least basically, so a string could, for example, be hello world, we can look at string methods. We've seen one or two of these already. So with string methods, we can do things with strings. We can modify them, but we can also learn things about them. A couple of these functions are, for example, upper and lower, to uppercase or lowercase something, to find something in a string, and that will then give us the position, the index of that uh, substring. We can do things like is digit, and this is basically asking the question, is this string a digit or not? And we'll get a Boolean variable, so true or false back. We can do split, that splits the strings into a list, and in split we can also, we can, we can pass a character to split, so for example, white space, and then we split a string into a list whenever we encounter that symbol. And we can also, for example, replace parts of a string. So with s.replace or the, the name of the string dot replace, then we give it a substring and then we give it something that we want the substring to be replaced with. And we're going to look at that now. Okay, so this is a string s abc. Our string is abc. And now let's do one thing first. So as I said, we can basically treat this as a list. So if we just do S0, what do we expect? We expect to see A. And if we do this, perfectly fine, we get the A. If we did S1, we would get the B. So this works really well. And now we can, of course, also do this slicing method here. So zero to two. And the same thing works for lists, by the way, as well. So that gives us AB, and what we can also do is we can use len, and len gives us the length of a list. So this just does not just work for strings, but this also works for lists. Uh, just to show that to you, so we could do L equals one, two, three, right? So this is now just a regular list, not a string. And now we can also do things like len L, and that will give us three, right? And we can also use the same slicing for lists. So we could do one to two, for example, and then we get just the two out of this. Okay, so this is how strings generally work. And what we can also do is we can use if statements to look for things in strings. So if we can do things like if a in s, so if a is in s, print a is in the string, or else print a is not in the string, let's run this. And this just works perfectly fine. a is in a string, let's change this up to bbc. And now let's run this, A is not in the string. So we can even do things like that. And of course, this also works with longer substrings. So this also works for lists, by the way. So you can basically treat a string as a list. What a list can't do is these use these string methods. And if you're interested in all of them, there's a full list in the official documentation, but I'm going to show you a couple of the most important ones, or at least some of the ones that, that make intuitive sense. So here we have a new string called hello world, so s, s is hello world, but this could of course also be any other thing, right? Remember, these names are arbitrary. So let's run s.upper, and s.upper will just give us the same string, but in uppercase. s.lower, that's um, now fairly easy, it will give us the same string in lowercase. Now s.find is a little bit more interesting. So we do s.find for world. And now this will give us the index at which this substring starts. So if we basically count this, so if we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, space, 5, and now we are at 6, right? And at this index 6, this word starts. So, or the substring starts, not necessarily a word, but the substring starts. So S find gives us the index where a substring starts, or we can find a substring. We can do is digit which is false here. Now, if I were to replace this by, let's say, one, two, three, this doesn't make it a number. It's not an integer now, but it's a string that represents a digit. If I now run this, we get true. So that works really well, and that can be useful. And there are many other of these is, is it something functions. We can run s.split, and if we don't put anything in here, this will split on white space. So this will now give us hello, world as a list in two words. This is basically tokenization. But we could give this any type of character to split on. So let's say we want to split on L. If we run this now, we get, well, he, and then nothing, and then O, and then war, and then the. So we are splitting on the L, which of course doesn't make too much sense, but it, but it works. 
which is more commonly used for very simple tokenization. And then we can also do replacements. So if we do S dot replace, and then we say what we want to look for, and then what we want to replace this with. So here we replace the A with an A, which doesn't make too much sense, but let's say we want to replace E with an uppercase E. Now we have hello world, but with an uppercase um, E here, or let's say we want to replace LL with, um, I don't know, just a tash or something like that. We could of course also do this. We can do all sorts of replacements here if we want to do that. Okay, a thing that I want to show you is the diff lib. And this is not something that you need every day, but I want to show this to you because it emphasizes the power of the tools that are already there within Python. So diffLib is part of Python and we can import that. And before I go into this, I want to briefly show you finally how this magic import thing works because we're going to use this now um, more and more. So we are now briefly in VS Code and we see two files here and you can look at them yourself. These are in the scripts folder. So to the left here, we can see a file called use function. And in that use function file, you see this magic import statement. Now there's a secondary file called myfunctions.py. And in myfunctions.py, we have one simple function and that function is called print 10 times. And it just loops for 10 times and prints the text that is given to it. Now, these are in the same folder and I can now use this import keyword here to basically make everything that's in that other file available to me. So if I do import my functions, I now can basically access everything that's in this my functions file in here. This allows me to structure my code and to also use other people's code because if they offer, for example, libraries, I can import parts of their code and use that in my code. This is a very, this is a key concept um, in coding and especially in the Python world. So now I can just say my function. And so I'm telling Python, okay, I want something out of this other file. I import my functions. I now want something out of this dot. And then I refer to what is in that file. And this is not limited to functions. This can also be done with variables. So we could, for example, put something like, um, let's just call this test variable in here and just say that this is one, two, three, right? Let's save that. And now if I'm in here, I can also do something like print my functions dot test variable. And we can try this. So if I run this, we will see 10 times high because I used this function here. And then we're also printing this test variable one, two, three. And so these magic import statements do nothing else, but they connect different files to each other, so to speak. And of course, this does not necessarily have to be only one file, but this could also be a whole lot of code that we then import using this import statement here. And this allows us to basically use external dependencies, use, use external code, but it's a very simple mechanism. There, there's lots of depth to it, but bottom line is it's actually fairly straightforward. We're just using code that is at some other location. Okay, so back in Google Collab, so we are importing diffLib and we're actually importing this library. So this is part of the Python standard library and we're importing this. So we are now making diffLib available to us. diffLib is a module that provides functions for comparing sequences. So we can now compare how similar or non-similar sequences of text are. And this does not work on semantics or anything, but this just works on the, um, well, there are different different functions in here, but generally speaking, it works based on how many things you need to change to go from one string to another string. So I just want to show this to you because this, this emphasizes that we can import stuff and then use other people's stuff. Well, this, this particular example, it's uh, Python's stuff, but we're going to look at another example uh, in a second. So here we have two sequences, sequence A and sequence B, two strings. Linguistics is awesome and linguistics is great. And now we can use a class or a function um, within diffLib that's called sequence matcher. Um, well, we're generating an object and we're using this, but let's not go into too many details here. So we are doing diffLib. So just as we did it with this my functions thing. So we are now telling Python, okay, I want something from the thing I've, I'm imp I've imported. So diffLib, and then we want to use sequence matcher. And now we hand these two sequences to the sequence matcher and we call this SM. 
And now we can use this ratio method here. And now we get a number between zero and one indicating how close these two strings are. So um, we can try this. So if I do awesome, awesome, so they are now similar. We now expect a perfect, perfect match. So one, if we just change one character, we drop slightly lower than that. And this is string similarity. And this is something that's very easy to achieve in Python if you know where to look. And you can, of course, look this up, and it's also in the documentation. But this is just an example of how easy it is to get fairly complicated things done rather quickly. All right, let's look now at regular expressions. And if you've never heard anything about regular expressions, I would recommend pausing this video for a second and just reading up on them or have a look at a video that explains the basics of this. General idea is that regular expressions are these patterns and we can use these patterns, these can be fairly complex, to search for texts or for strings and then modify them. And this allows us to go beyond just one particular thing we look for, but this allows us to actually use complicated patterns to look for stuff. Um, again, if you've never seen those, uh, go look them up because I can't give you a full introduction to regular expressions here. But these are uh, very interesting and very, very useful in many cases. So to use them in Python, we need to import something again. And here we are importing RE for regular expressions. And this now allows us to use these functions. And these work relatively similar to the regular old string functions that we've just, or string methods we've just looked at. So for example, find, but using regular expressions or patterns. There are more than these, but these are four of the most useful methods. So search, find all, split, and substitute or sub. And for all of these, we are basically handing this thing a regular expression, a pattern, and then the string we want to use on that. So with search, we find the first instance of that pattern in a string. With find all, we find all the instances of that pattern in a string. With split, we are splitting the string based on this pattern. And with substitute, we can substitute one pattern with another pattern. And what this exactly means we will look at now. Okay, so we are importing regular expressions here. Let's do that. And now we need some text. And our example text will be, despite carefully cleaning the crime scene, she was quickly captured by police. Now let's assume that we want to find all the adverbs. And we are using a very crude method here. And we're going to look for words that end in L-Y. And of course, this is not and not not very useful in real life, but it's a good example. So, and of course we now can't use regular string functions because if we just used string find, how would we, how would we look for all instances in which there is something and then ly? So we need patterns for that, search patterns for that. And maybe you've done something similar with just star ly. And that's an approximation of that. So we are going, now going to use a very simple regular expression pattern for this. And this is that pattern here. And to differentiate regular strings from regular expressions, we are putting an R in front of the string. So R and then the pattern. And so this pattern will be uh, backslash W plus LY. And let's briefly look whether this actually works. So we're going to look at this regular expression side here. So this is our text and this is the expression and we are actually matching carefully and quickly here. Um, if we got rid of the ly, we would just match the words as expected and then we add ly here. Okay, so the pattern generally speaking works and now we do the same thing in Python. Okay, so I've put the pattern in here. Um, let's actually put this into its own line and we could change it more easily and Let's save that. And now we are going to generate matches. And we're doing this with the find all method because we don't want to find only one match, but we want to find all the matches. And we hand to this find all method, we hand the pattern and we also hand it the text. And we run this. And now we get something in matches here. And we don't just get the individual findings but we actually get so-called match objects. And these match objects are, well, the string themselves, but if we, for example, have groups, and we'll look at that in a second, these also contain these groups. So let's look into our matches here. And if I just look at this, we will get carefully and quickly. So that worked really, really well. And if we 
if the case is that simple, we don't even have to think about this whole match object situation. Okay, so now let's have a look at groups. So let's say we take the same example. So we want to look for the adverbs, but now we also want to get the base. And so we want to get, we want to find all of the adverbs, but we then also want to have access to the base form without the ly. Not the most useful thing to do, but it works. So what we do here is, so we are now using groups. So we have one group for the whole thing, so to speak. And then we have another subgroup for just a sequence of characters without the ly. And now we're doing a find all again for the pattern and the text. Let's run this. So let's look for all the matches. And so we loop over the matches and print every single match. I just have to update the text. And let's do this. And now we get both groups for each of these. And this is where these match objects come into play. So now each of these match objects actually contains two matches, or not necessarily matches, but two things. And so these are now the two groups. So now we could, for example, for each just access the first group. And if we did that, we would just get careful and quick, or just that, and then we would get the whole adverb. And so we can use these groups or we can access these groups here. Okay, so maybe I'll add that as another example here. Now, now that we have seen this uh, group magic, we can look at substitution. So substitution is basically a replacement, but using two patterns. So let's say we have this text here, $25 and $30. And now we want to flip around the position of the currency sign. So we want to go from $25 to $25 and from $30 to $30. And now we are going to use regular expressions again. We are going to use sub here. And you can already see the result that we want. So we want $25 and $30. And we are going to do this by again using two groups. And in this example, we are going to look for, well, we're going to look for dollar sign and then a digit or digits, but we're going to group these in a way that we have the currency sign in its own group. And then we have the number in its own group. And now for the replacement or substitution part, we can use these indices using backslash and an indice. And this refers to the groups. So the second group here is actually the amount. And the first group is the dollar sign. So if we just flip this on its head, so backslash two, backslash one, we will get the result that we want. So let's run this. And just to show you that this actually works, let's do one, two. And now this should get us exactly the same thing. We could also do something like add, for example, something in here and do something like this and can play and we can play around with this. So we can use these groups then in our replacement. And this is a, actually a very powerful feature that we have available to us. Now, finally, let's put all of this together and let's try to do that. So let's assume we want to do this whole adverb thing. So let's go. The first thing we do is we open this file linguistics.txt. And this is also in this uh, Wikipedia data folder. And we read this into this data thing now. So we then have a string that's called data that contains the whole linguistics.txt file. Now we are going to use that same trick we just used above to find all of the adverbs, at least adverbs that end in ly. And for this particular text, we get traditionally, directly, logically, and particularly. And also we've added the little thing here. We've added a word boundary here because there are, well, I can show you what happens if we don't do this. If we don't do this, we will also get things like, and that's part of analysis actually, because this does not, of course, look for words. This has no concept of words or anything. This is just one continuous string that's important to note. And that's why we just add the word boundary here so that we get full, full words or full tokens to be more precise. And these are these here. And now we want to save them so that we can do something else with them for our example in our analysis. So we are going to open a file called results.txt, this time using the write attribute. And then we are going to use f.write lines so that each of these words will be written on a line. And now if we cat this, we will see the files. However, we will not see the line breaks. Um, they are there in the actual file. But now we have written 
our results. So we've, we've read a text file, then we look for something, and then we stored our results in a new file again. And this then is this whole little workflow. Okay, finally, let's look at a third party library called text directory. And this is actually a library I maintain. And this is not meant as an advertisement, this is just meant to show you something interesting. And the point of this is not to promote this or to tell you that you have to use this, but the point is to show you how external dependencies or external libraries can be used to do interesting things. And we are going to look at other libraries that are more popular later, but I chose to use text directory because I know it very well and I know the internals really well. So the idea of text directory is that we have, and this is useful in corpus linguistics, that we have a directory on our computer, a folder that contains multiple text files, for example, a corpus. And now we want to aggregate or combine these text files. And before we do this, we maybe want to filter these. So we don't want all of them possibly, but we want to make a selection. We want to make, for example, uh, we, for example, we want to draw a random sample. And so text directory allows us to do various things. So we start with a folder of text files. Then in stage one, we can apply a number of filters to select text files. Then we can optionally run transformations. So we can change the text. And this is useful, for example, in cleaning up the data. And then ultimately we can aggregate the text so that we have either one file or that we have one long string that contains all of the text so that we can then run further processing or further analysis on it. Now let's look at this in code. And I want to show this to you so that you have a first glance at what working with external dependencies looks like. So text directory is not part of Python, but this is an external library that we are now going to use in our code. So the first step is to import text directory and I have installed text directory. And if we go to the very top here, you can see that I ran this command here, pip install text directory. And if we run this, this will download text directory and then install it on your local system. Okay, now we've installed it. We will point it, and this is this step here, to our data folder. And I'm using this Wikipedia example here again. So again, remember, there are three files in here. So I'm going to um, create a text directory object called TD, and then I'm going to use the syntax here. So text directory dot text directory, and then I'm pointing this to this data folder. And I'm running this, and now nothing happens, but we now have this td object here. And now the next step is to actually load the files. And I do this by running this method called load files. And in here, I can also tell it to look for specific file types. So let's say we had multiple file types in here. Um, we could specify which ones we want. So we want .txt files, and we also want to have them sorted. So let's run this. Again, nothing happened. Internally, things happen. And now let's look at what happened so far. So if we now run print aggregation, we get a little bit of output here. So what we get now is we get the path for these files. Well, we can't see the file names here because it's um, it's too long for this output format here. And the characters and the tokens and whether this text has been transformed. So now we see that we have three files in here. So far, nothing has happened with them. We've just loaded them up and we, we basically now can see what we are looking at. Now we want to filter these, or we want to draw a sample. So what we do here is we use filter by min characters. There are multiple filters here. So if I go td.filter, then you can look at all the filters that are there. So we, for example, can filter by files. So the file has to contain something. We can look for file size or the amount of tokens and things like that. Or we can just do random sampling. But for this example, we are going to filter by minimum characters. And so we're going to filter by two th minimum 2,000 characters. So ideally, we would now end up with this first file and the second file, and we would get rid of this third file. So let's run this and then print this again. OK, so this worked really well. So now we just have two files. And now let's say we also want to do some data uh, cleaning or data munging. So Let's say we, and this doesn't make too much sense now, but let's say we need all of our text to be uppercase. So we are now staging a transformation. And staging the transformation does not mean that it is being performed, but that we tell 
the software, we tell the library to basically prepare everything to run this. Because we did, we, we could, for example, do multiple transformations, or we could do a pipeline of transformations. So let's let's do this. And now we have stage transformations, the transformation uppercase. And now finally, we can run an aggregate command. So TD aggregate to memory. And this will now basically do all the things. So now we've selected which files we want. We already selected a transformation or we stage the transformation. And now if we run this, this will happen. So now we get output. So now these two files that we selected are being aggregated and they are also being transformed. And we now have everything in uppercase as one long string that we could now do things with. And of course, there's a little bit more to all of that. And again, this is not a thorough introduction to this tool, but I just wanted to show you that we can use external libraries to basically add functionality to our own tools. And now let's say we want to build some sort of an analysis pipeline. And as part of this, we need to aggregate texts and we maybe need to also draw a random sample. We can now just use this existing library to do that. And we don't have to think about all the nitty gritty details and we can just combine this. And so we can use these external libraries to do that. This is one example of how to do that. All right. Have a look at the exercises and try to solve them. There is one straightforward one and there is one a little bit a harder one. And of course, there are also solutions for these and have a look at the solutions because in the solutions, I discuss further details. And I also discuss at least to a certain extent how I approach these exercises and what you could do there 